Hello, my name is Tony. Sometimes, if you're anything like me, God help you if you are, but sometimes you may feel an urge to watch something that's the movie equivalent of an insane slice of sweating, brainless, gutter trash pie. Something dressed with a blood-red corn syrup sauce and deep-fried in rotting seaweed batter. Something submerged in a broiling hot rancid dustbin of putrid liquid lard and raw sewage. You don't? Oh, all right. Well, let's for one moment assume that you do. What do you mean, no, you have standards? What the hell are you doing on this channel? Well, whatever the case, whatever your moral code is that I may say I respect but don't really, I'm going to assume the worst of you and give you a taste of one of those premier toxic cinematic trifles to satisfy your depraved urges. Monster, otherwise known as Humanoids from the Deep, is just the ticket. Follow me, sunshine. Roger Corman, Mr. Exploitation himself, had cottoned on to Jaws and Alien, having been involved in a multiplicity of capacities on low-budget horror science fiction and various unrepentant exploitation vehicles in the 50s, 60s and 70s, he was well-versed in the art of the adaptation game, or the theft game, imitation game, rip-off game, whichever terminology best applies to your understanding. He took a few shots of respectability over the years with his screen renderings of the works of Edgar Allan Poe and providing early opportunities to such future luminaries as Jack Nicholson, James Cameron, Joe Dante, Ron Howard, Galan Hurd, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, Peter Bogdanovich and Nicholas Rogue. At heart though, Corman was a Hollywood pirate, a mercenary carpetbagger unafraid to shamelessly free boot, make it cheap, sell it hard and turn a fast healthy profit. He used to boast he never lost money on a picture and he was involved in the making of around 300 when it came to Monster or Humanoids from the Deep, which he funded and executive produced uncredited for his company, New World Pictures, he left director Barbara Peters in no doubt regarding his expectations. The monster should, and I quote, kill all the men and rape all the women, unquote. These were not only his expectations, but those he insisted of the intended audience, whoever they were thought to be. Peters, who had a history with this sort of stuff, having worked on numerous exploitation and softcore porn flicks previously, apparently delivered confidently on the guts and gore content, but was a bit too coy for Coleman's liking when it came to the sex and nudity. To remedy this, Coleman charged the second unit director with filming more additional scenes, which were added to the final edit. Only he neglected to involve the director or the actors, and some of them were less than pleased with the result. Still, the exploitation by its very nature exploits, it says that on the tin. If you were aware of Roger Coleman and his history, what did you expect exactly? More tea, Vicar, and would you like extra butter on that crumpet? Coleman had seen Jaws, so we wanted a threat from beneath the sea. Coleman had seen Alien, so we wanted some alien-like creatures to be the threat. He'd also seen the way the face hugger in Alien planted its seed in John Hurd. He wanted the creatures to attack humanity for a reason. Because they feel threatened by man, Rog? No. Because they want our jobs? No. Uh, they want to run for the Senate? No. What then? To impregnate. What? Yeah, impregnate. They want to rape human women and get them pregnant. They want our women to give them babies. Sounds a bit sick, Rog. Oh yeah, it is. The monsters in many horror movies, no matter how physically different from us, freaky, bizarre or otherworldly they may be, often develop connections with and attractions towards human women. King Kong, the creature from the Black Lagoon, even the big reptilian thing in Krull, all want relationships with our girls. It'll never work for any number of reasons, can't they see that? But it's what they want, and they whack the shit out of anything standing in the way of their desires. What we have with Humanoids from the Deep is a spiritual throwback to the creature features of the 50s and 60s, only this time with more graphic violence, sex and nudity, and an exploitative and morally bankrupt philosophy propping it up. In order to get a handle on where it's coming from, despite a wealth of material to draw upon for inspiration, it zeroes in on 1964's The Horror of Party Beach, a film considered to be the front-running contender for the title of Worst Film of All Time. There are plot similarities to close for comfort to be accidental. I've said it before and I'll say it again, if you're gonna steal, at least steal from something good. But no, the world won't listen, and Roger Corman certainly won't. 
With a budget of $2.5 million, it was enough to cast some comparatively well-known actors in leading roles. Doug McClure, best remembered for appearing in 249 episodes of The Virginian from 1962 to 1971, got the top spot as local hero and good guy Jim Hill. In the 70s, McClure reinvented himself as a B-movie action hero, appearing in three cardboard cutout fantasy adventure films produced from a partnership between British Amicus Studios and American International Pictures. They were all loosely based on fiction by Tarzan creator Edgar Rice Burroughs, The Land That Time Forgot, At the Earth's Core, and The People That Time Forgot. His final outing in this vein, Warlords of Atlantis in 1978, was a separate entity made by EMI Films. Amicus was dead by then. I mention them because I have fond memories of all four, undemanding escapist entertainment with a personable but terminally limited star heading them up. I miss those days and actors like McClure, who seem perfectly happy to just be in gainful employment and doing what they do. He's one of the plus points in Humanoids from the Deep. As is the prolific Vic Morrow, a talented director and actor who was to be tragically killed in a helicopter accident on the set of John Landis's movie version of The Twilight Zone in 1982. Morrow was an instantly recognisable character due to appearing in so many TV shows and movies over time. He was especially good at playing a heavy or villainous type. Here he's the villainous type, a racist fisherman called Hank Slattery. Finally, we get Anne Turkle, whose main claim to fame was being the ex-model who married Richard Harris and ended up being cast in some films alongside him. Until they divorced, then she stopped being cast in some films alongside him. Funny that? She plays a scientist, Dr. Susan Drake, who works for a cannery company called Canco, whilst looking like she works for a calamitous cartel called Can't Act. The remaining cast members are fuck who knows, but don't worry, it's not like it matters. Before we go any further, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you of the importance of subscribing in order to maintain the continued growth, health and welfare of the channel. Even more important, if you're able to do so, is to hit the thanks button and make a very welcome contribution to keeping this channel up and running and promoting the production of new content. Many thanks, much appreciated. Now back to our main feature. In fishing community Noyo on the Californian coast, the natives are restless. Cannery company Kanko want to open a new cannery and boost the local economy. The community, represented in part by Hank Slattery, Vic Morrow and his crew of redneck beer-swilling thugs, are all in favour. The local indigenous minority group led by young Johnny Eagle, Anthony Penner, are threatening legal action to scotch the plans and preserve the environment. This all seems familiar, almost like a prophecy. Local citizen Jim Hill, Doug McClure, is a, well, dunno. He's something. He's got a nice boat and a cute wife and an infant kid and a brother. And whilst he's in favour of the cannery plan, has respect and sympathy for Johnny and the rest of his tribe. I guess. All of which is incidental because the world is about to turn to shit. Scientist Dr. Susan Drake Ann Turkle, who works for Kanko, has been introducing a DNA-altering growth hormone into the coastal waters to increase the size and proliferation of the salmon. A side effect has been a mutation in some of the other marine life, resulting in the development of amphibious humanoid creatures hungry for love. Well, sex. The humanoids from the deep are horny for human women. They want to have sex with them, kill the men and rape the women. That was the brief, and that's what they do. Such is the plot, which is merely an excuse to give the audience exploding boats and trucks, topless or naked women being sexually assaulted by extras wearing rubber monster costumes, fist fights, blood guts, gore, gunfire, and a climactic battle between the locals and the monsters during a nighttime festival on the waterfront. Utterly tasteless, very base, screamingly ugly, really dumb and silly. No, not Prince Harry. It's almost a step-by-step -step paint by numbers exercise in making an exploitation flick. Deadpan and lacking any sense of real irony or humour, it is, however, capable of inducing mirth by accident rather than design. It kicks off with a knockabout rib tickler of a father, son and crew of a fishing boat getting blown up. When something is snarled in the nets, can you guess what it is? The father orders the fat little doofus of a kid to fill the winch motor up with gas. The kid is all of ten, so can easily be trusted with this activity. So remarkable is his eye-to-hand coordination. He drops the can, spilling petrol everywhere. A crew member tries to fire off a flare to get help after the kid, who's really fucking accident prone, falls in the water and is mangled to pulp by something in the depths. The crewman trips and shoots the flare into the petrol and the boat explodes. Good start to the day, by my standards. Then Jim's dog is dismembered and so are the dogs owned by Slattery and his good old boys. Slattery blames Johnny Eagle for the canine massacre, which leads to a fist fight at the 
monotone, social or antisocial. Jim intervenes in support of Johnny and there's a right punch-up. Next day, teenagers Jerry, Megan, King and Peggy, Lynn Schiller visit an isolated beach for a swim, some hormone release and DNA swapping of their own. Jerry is mutilated by a monster who then rips off Peggy's bikini and rapes her. Later, on the same stretch of deserted beach, Becky, Lisa Glaser and her boyfriend Billy, David Strassman and his ventriloquist dummy, it defies explanation, just accept it, are in a flimsy tent. Just as Becky gets her kit off, a monster tears the tent to shreds, kills Bill and chases after a naked. Becky. She almost gets away until another monster pops up and rapes her, from behind, just to vary things, one presumes. As the attacks increase and rumours spread, Peggy is found alive and traumatised, and naked, naturally. And Jim teams up with Dr. Drake to try and combat the monster attack on the festival by spraying fuel into the bay and setting it alight. Not the smartest idea, wouldn't you set the boats moored there on fire also, as well as the wooden boardwalk? No? Oh, okay. In the aftermath, the locals are shaken by events, and Drake is back at the Canco base, supervising a heavily pregnant Peggy, who has gone into labour. A screaming humanoid monster bursts out of her swollen abdomen. Film ends. See? Told you Coleman had seen Alien. If by now you're wondering if you should watch it or not, here are some thoughts and observations to help you decide. On some level, I'm in awe of the concept and how it's executed. The monsters, created and designed by Rob Boteen, manage the unsettling feat of looking essentially unconvincing, yet so slimy, toxic and repugnant, they add an off-putting, nausea-inducing dimension to their perverse sexual interactions. Any prurient interest in the nudity is cancelled by the repulsiveness of the acts it precedes. It's immediate unattractive because 1. The female nudity is a prelude to violent rape and 2. It's raped by a mutated fish monster. And anyone finding that a turn on probably needs to be more than a little concerned. Most of my mental stimulation seemingly still comes from a mildly bemused I still can't believe they made this reaction. The battle on the seafront is bloody and quite inventively shot. The monsters are bullet sponges and need multiple hits to take them down. There's the bonus of a local radio announcer trying to defend a local beauty queen, dubbed Miss Salmon, Linda Shane. Who the fuck would enter a beauty contest to get that title? Goes without saying, one of the monsters gets to her and her bikini falls off, which by now is the standard. She batters it to death with a rock, however. Go feminism! There are some moments which generate moderate tension when two of the monsters attack Jim's wife Carol, Cindy Weintraub, in her home. She hides her infant son in a cupboard and takes him on with household detergent and butcher knives. Driven by the instinct to protect her child, she makes one hell of a mess of them. It's home invasion territory handled with reasonable competence by director Peters. Doug McClure makes a decent enough aging beefcake hero. Vic Morrow is the most nuanced character, one starting out as a provocative and belligerent villain, who, realising he's wrongly targeted Johnny Eagle and firebombed his home needlessly, backtracks a bit, reveals a smattering of regret, then goes on to risk his own life to save a little girl in the climactic set piece. As for Anne Turkle, she has two emotional settings, theatrically exaggerated boredom and frozen face blankness. Her lines are delivered with all the verbal texture and feeling of Stephen Hawking's voice synthesizer with a battery running low. Ain't that the truth, pilgrims? It's an unpleasant and uncomfortable seafood platter of derivative sci-fi cinema and eco-horror that seems to revel in its own lack of self-insight and wasted capacity for satire. It plays it straight with no winks, nods or nudges to the audience or in-jokes or other devices to indicate that it's not intended to be taken seriously. I still wonder at just who Coleman thought was the target audience. Be a drinking slobs with an instinctive magnetic attraction towards sleazy, gory, trash exploitation flicks served up with a side order of gratuitous nudity and ground zero intellectual function? Geez, sounds like me. I can switch off my brain with the rest of them, you may have noticed. So Humanoids from the Deep is something I'm suitably entertained by when I've dialed down the dimmer control. Sometimes I'll try to find something in a movie that justifies my enjoyment and interest, something allegorical or philosophical, or some socially and culturally valid component cleverly woven into the fabric of the film. I'm hard-pressed with Humanoids, and wouldn't you know it, I've come up empty. It's the sort of thing you're either entertained by and accept on its own pop trash terms for what it is, or you don't. That's about all. Thanks for your time and attention, I appreciate it. Please consider hitting like, didn't like, leaving a comment, subscribing, checking out my Patreon page, or the very important super thanks button below. If you think I plumbed the depths with this one, you may be right. Only don't count on it. Soon, pilgrims.